Welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna pause as everyone um, comes into the webinar today before we get started, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us for our next edition of our 49er Industry Chat. My name is Noemi Guevara and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at California State University, Long Beach. Before we start, we'll let you know the session is being recorded and it will live on our website at csuob.edu forward slash alumni. Also, we encourage you to use the Q&A box located below or above your screen to submit any questions for our guest speaker today. And now it's my honor to introduce our speaker. Dr. Kopchek um, pursued his undergraduate degree at CSUB with the goal of becoming a professor and researcher. Upon completing his master's degree at CSUB, he began working at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in San Pedro. He was accepted into the biology PhD program at USC, focusing his studies on the forest of kelp commonly found along our coast. He held a research position at North Carolina, North Carolina State University, then returned to Long Beach to become the founding director of the UCLA Ocean Discovery Center at the Santa Monica Pier. He developed plans and worked with architects to build a new science education center beneath the historic carousel. Later joining the California Science Center as curator of the of the expansion and aquarium built in Exposition Park, please, um, where his work in informal science education continues to date. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kopsack. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm very happy to be here. It's, uh, it's very exciting to be able to come back. Uh, as the intro screen showed and uh, I think has been put out there, I have a long history with Cal State Long Beach, having three different degrees, two graduate degrees and an undergraduate degree from the university. So I'm very happy to be able to uh, share my experiences and hopefully provide some, uh, some thoughts to some current students or former students about my background and my history and how I went from Cal State Long Beach on to where I am today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Here we go, bring that up, whoops, share. Okay, and I know that's still where you're seeing not the actual presentation. Let me, whoop, there's my mouse. There we go. So, uh, that's, there, you go. there we go. So that's the official title of my talk. Um, as I said, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I've got all those degrees. In addition, my wife and our two children are also alums of Cal State Long Beach. So the university has always played a, a major role in our family uh, history as, as it's gone on. Uh, this could be a, an alternative for my presentation, uh, which in some ways is a better description of the career path, change of career paths that I made. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, my original plan and then how it changed and how that subtitle there uh, was a critical part of that change. Wonderful. So I discovered this quote from Cesar Chavez a number of years ago. Actually, it was just this year, I have to admit. Uh, and I, I saw it uh, at a school just down the street from where I live here. I, I live almost within walking distance of the university uh, that we have over this whole time period. And I looked at it and I looked at it, I thought, oh, interesting. I, and it didn't really sink in. But then it, one of, it was one of those things. One day it suddenly clicked in my mind. It's like, oh, this is what I've been doing with my life. I've been using the knowledge I have and using it to help other people. Uh, and that, that was a big part of why I changed my career goal from being a professor at a university to ending up in what's called informal science education, which I'll talk more about. Uh, and I can honestly say that sharing my knowledge with other people is really what I, I've done with throughout my career. I think it's the most important thing I've been able to do. So this is the giant kelp. 
uh, that forms the forest around the shallow waters, in the shallow waters right along our coast where there are rocky bottoms. Hopefully, it's somewhat familiar to many of you, if only from encounters with piles of it washed up on the beach. Uh, kelp has been the major object of my research interest since I started my PhD program, but I'm not going to talk specifically about my science research or delve into any particular branch of science today. Rather, today's story is about how I started out with one what I thought was a very clear career goal, and in the process of, of achieving that goal, decided that I was going to make a course correction. So the point of today's presentation isn't going to detail my career in science, but rather to tell the story of how I started out with a goal of be, having a career as a scientist in a university where I could help train the next generation of scientists. But then I made the switch to a career as a museum curator in an informal science education facility. Uh, and basically I did that because of that quote from Cesar Chavez, although though at the time I didn't, had, didn't even know about the quote, uh, but I knew I could share my knowledge of science with, a wider, uh, with the wider general public than I could if I stayed at, in the university. Um, so what I wanna tell you about is how I prepared to make the switch. Uh, and what I'll say right off is that I still, for some reason, and I, and I, was, I was an undergraduate at Cal State Long Beach from the fall of 76 through the spring of 80. And, um, but I still have this one very vivid memory of sitting outside of the, uh, at the time, which was called Science One uh, lecture halls. And I remember hearing behind me, I think, I heard some of my classmates having a discussion about all the plans they had made, how they were gonna take this class and the next semester they were gonna take that class. And then in the summer, they were gonna get this job. And it sounded like they had everything completely planned out. And I just remember thinking, boy, I really must have screwed up somehow because I don't have anything mm -hmm. like that planned out. And I'll say up front right now that this, this won't be any kind of a recipe or, or set of steps that you could follow to make this happen. And I sort of went in and out in a, in a sort of an informal way, but I'll share that all with you as I, as I go along. So uh, since few of you, if any, have heard of informal science education, let me define that phrase. Uh, as anyone who knows me can attest though that I'm quite fascinated by Macrocystis periphera, which is the scientific name of the giant kelp that you see on the screen. But I think the people that know me, and there's still quite a few people at Cal State Long Beach that know me, uh, they'd probably agree that the word fascination is probably not strong enough. It's sort of more like an addiction. Uh, but I didn't always have that focus on kelp. In fact, I started my scientific career studying fish ecology at Long Beach State. Uh, but first, let's go back and take a look at a comparison between formal and informal learning. So at least you have that basis. Um, formal learning and the, and the differentiation here as we go through this slide on the two columns, formal learning is basically what happens in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So as, when we're young, uh, depending on how far we go in school, through high school at least, or through college, uh, all of our learning is formal learning set in a classroom. Uh, Formal learning is structured, it's an explicit organization and it's, uh, or what we would call the curriculum. It is goal oriented in so far as it has to fit in to the timeline that's set by the school calendar and the professor or the teacher will decide, okay, we're gonna cover these chapters in this period of time. Uh, there's gonna be a test here, all those sorts of things. So it, uh, it is led, ultimately it's led by an instructor. Uh, who generally, especially at the university level, is an expert in their field. On the other side of this chart, and the main difference is that informal learning is what happens outside the classroom. And there was there are some researchers in the field of informal science education. Uh, I will mention that when I first started at the California Science Center 20 years ago or so, there was no real theory or understanding of how people learned in settings like museums. But in that time span since then, a whole framework of theory and uh, research has been conducted to understand how people learn in these settings. The other part of the research that the same group did uh, indicates that, you know, if we, if we think of our entire lifetime, 
the time we spend in a classroom, which is in the younger part, the early part of our lifetime, that represents only about, on average, 5% of our entire lifetime, which means 95% of our life we don't spend in a classroom. And that's where so much learning comes in. Uh, let's see, I don't want to get too far off of my, my notes here. Uh, try to keep everything on happening. Okay, so uh, informal learning happens in a classroom. Uh, and the other big difference is that it's led by the learner themselves. So it's self-led. You are essentially the instructor. You are making decisions about how I want to engage with this information. How long do I want to spend looking at it? Uh, so much of this for me is in reference to a museum. So how long do I want to spend at this exhibit? Or how long do I want to spend in this gallery? And it's up to you to make those decisions. The notion here on this graph, which I didn't make, I found it on the web that I would quibble with is the notion that informal learning is unplanned. And it's unplanned to the extent that you may not go see a documentary movie with the idea that I'm going to go learn something here. But if it happens to be a movie about a subject in which you're interested, you might learn something. So to that extent, it may not be planned, but it's definitely not correct at all to say that um, Uh, that it's that it's not uh, structured in some way, uh, or that it lacks an organization. The I can tell you that after having spent tw the last 25 years of my life or so creating science museum exhibits, I can attest that while when you walk into a museum or into a gallery, nobody hands you a printed curriculum saying, these are the galleries you should visit and the exhibits you should visit and the order in which you should visit them. But there is there is an underlying organization on which some curator has labored uh, for quite some time in many cases to organize the content of the exhibit. Uh, a good exhibit will be well organized and the curator and their the development team will have made decisions about what what parts of the of the, of the topic should be kept in and what could be left out. So uh, again, it's not that there's no organization there. Uh, Museum exhibits also have goals uh, and major, the major sort of goals is we hope the visitors come away with some clearer understanding of the topic that was presented. Uh, the major difference there is that there's no rigid timeline. We don't have to fit it into a school year uh, schedule. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the learner can take their time, uh, you know, they get museum fatigue and leave, come back on another day, do, you know, however they want to do it. Um, have they already talked a bit about informal learning? I'll also, I also want to mention that it may be, you may hear it called, and I'll use this term probably uh, later on in the talk as well, as free choice learning. And that is to distinguish that it is the learner, not an instructor who is choosing what to learn and the order in which they'll encounter the subject matter. Now, I want to make clear that uh, informal learning is not limited to science. Well, informal learning can occur in any field in which the learner is interested. Uh, you can learn informally about history or about uh, geology, uh, any non-scientific field, not that geology isn't science. I know we have at least one uh, former science major, uh, geology major, and I'll just give them a shout out. I, I, I think sometimes I've, I've become very interested in geology in my later life. And uh, I think it, in some ways, if I had to do it over again and it was influenced a little differently, I might have gone into geology. But uh, anyway, it's it's an amazing field. Wonderful. So I did have a question because you're talking about informal learning and just yes. at the ver various locations you've worked, you've been able to marry that informal learning with that service component that you were talking about mm -hmm. like I know you know at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in San Peter one of your first jobs like I know as a child I as an inner kid inner city we would take the bus there and we right. were introduced to that center with LAUSD they had a partnership and you know what a great opportunity for kids to really learn and appreciate, you know, and, um, the conservation of the S Southern California beaches and mm -hmm. sharing that um, informal learning with also that education component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about how, what it was like working at, at that place? Oh, it, it was great. Uh, and, and as I'll 
get to in my presentation as I go along. I've actually worked at Cabrillo twice. Okay. So it's also sort of like home to me. Uh, it, yeah, it it's where I really got my first opportunity to, uh, so to speak, get my feet wet. Uh, it was as a part-time mm -hmm. aquarist. Uh, actually, I, I got my hands wet because I spent most of my time staffing the touch tank and helping kids and adults learn about the different species that live between high tide and low tide along the beach. And so that's where the education part comes in. Uh, I also spent a good deal of that time, and I'll circle back to this too, uh, as an aquarist caring for the animals. So I learned quite a bit about that. And those are two, two of the examples of, uh, of my sort of taking a side uh, detour into informal learning and then coming back into more formal education about my career. Yeah, it's great. And it, it's really fantastic when, you know, you, you could see kids. Kids, it's often said kids are natural, naturally born as scientists and they have this natural curiosity and mm -hmm. they look at these weird creatures. For anybody that's been to uh, uh, a touch tank before, or been down to the tide pools at a beach uh, or been to a touch tank anywhere, you'll know that the, the species that live there don't, necessarily even look like anything very familiar. Many of them don't have anything that looks like a face or a head. Uh, their, their, their shapes are very strange. And uh, the number one question that I always found that came up when I would work at a touch tank was, what is that? People want to know <laughs> what it is. And, and my having heard that question so many times over so many years by my assumption is that people need to know what something is so that they can fit it into the, the knowledge that they have, the structure of their own knowledge and say, oh, okay, that's what that is. And now I can, now I, now I'm free to ask other questions about it because now that I can place it somewhere in context, I can ask more questions, but it was always amazing. I mean, uh, when some young child was very interested in something and would ask questions and you'd answer them and it was not unusual to get these, what are obvious aha moments and you'd answer their question and they'd, their face would light up and they'd, they'd just smile and it would be like, oh, okay, I understand that, you know? And that, right. that feedback is just so incredible. It's a, real, it's a real rush. I'm sure there's some neurotransmitter that gets released in the brain for that to, to give you sort of a, a, you know, a shot of like, oh man, that's cool. Right. Okay, so, uh, that's everything there. The only other thing here is I, some of you out there may be the kind of people like I am that want to know what does that acronym stand for? Uh, so I just circled these and gave what the thing was because I didn't know what they were. If you're an acronym person, there it is for you. I'm not going to go into any detail about any of that stuff. So as I said, my, my focus initially at Long Beach State, even as an undergraduate, uh, was to... Uh, eventually become a professor somewhere. And I, I started my, I went to Long Beach State for a couple of reasons. I was born and raised here in the Harbor area. I was born in San Pedro and grew up there until I got married. And then we moved to Long Beach. Uh, actually, my wife already lived in Long Beach, but I moved to Long Beach. Uh, and I really started, I, I picked Long Beach for two reasons. One, it was close by. And two, it had a marine biology program. And I, I made up my mind in high school that I wanted to go into marine biology. Uh, it's, it's, I, I won't spend any time talking about that, but uh, that's, that's sort of how I got there. And then, mm -hmm. then I continued on down that path. Uh, let me keep going through the slides so we don't run over too far. So as I started down that path uh, and completed my undergraduate work, uh, I then went on and got into the master's program there in the biology department. And, you know, is it, it's sort of like the apprenticeship of, of going on in the, in the academic side of things is that yeah, graduate students have to sort of do things that uh, the faculty members don't want to do or other people don't want to do. So one of the first jobs that I had uh, as a master's student was to as this picture shows, you might not understand it, but I was uh, I was in charge of getting fish poop out of buckets of seawater. Now I'm not going to go into any detail right now about what that's all about, 
But mm -hmm. if there are questions at the end and if there's enough time or whatever, I can talk a little bit more about that. But that's what that picture was all about. So let's, whoop, let's go back here. So in terms of going from my initial formal career goal of being a scientist to becoming an informal science education expert, uh, the first part of my pathway looks like this. So there, there, I have a few slides here. There's like two or three more of these. Uh, in terms of getting from the academic side of things into the informal science side of things, there are two, actually three, uh, and maybe more uh, entry points that, to which you could go. There's what I call the academic entry point, uh, which is in red there. And my academic experience shows up down in that yellow box in red. So you can see I started my undergraduate work at, in the fall of 76, completed that in the spring of 80, and then stuck around there uh, in 19, in 80, in September and begin my, my master's degree. Uh, let's see. So, uh, so you'll see those same colored pathways. And you'll notice at the end of the master's degree, when I completed that, I ended up at the Carrillo Marine Aquarium. And I already talked about that. Now, part of the reason I stayed to get the master's is because, well, for one thing, I was the very first student in my family a uh, member of my family to actually enroll in and then eventually graduate from a four-year college. And I was the very first member of my family to go into anything like graduate school. So I had nobody that could tell me what the heck is all this about and what do I do and how do I do this? So right. I ended up, although my goal was not to, my goal was to get a PhD, uh, but because I didn't realize I had to get my applications in, I missed that year after my undergraduate uh, or the time I should have making, been making those applications during my undergraduate work. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't get any offers to, to get in any place. So I said, okay, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to work in marine biology. I'll work in uh, fish ecology on a, on a project that had to do with fish poop. So yeah. maybe we'll hear more about that later. Yeah. Dr. Kopsak, did you rely on any faculty member to guide you to say you should consider jumping into your master's right after? Yes. Uh, at the time, I uh, it was towards the end of my undergraduate that I took some of the some of the uh, uh, elective courses, one of which, mm -hmm. although I can't believe that was an elective. And if it wasn't, I don't know why I took it late at the end. Uh, Dr. Richard Bray was the uh, ichthyologist, the fish scientist at Cal State Long Beach in the biology department at the time. And I, I stuck, struck up a relationship with him and talked mm -hmm. to him. And I told him what I was interested in doing and all of that. And he gave me some advice that honestly, I didn't necessarily listen to, which was part of the problem here. And I'll, I'll go into that briefly in a moment. Uh, so yes, he, he helped me a lot. Mm -hmm. He really talked to me about uh, and I'm going to pass on his advice to me, to everybody who's here today. Wonderful. Let's, let's see. Okay. So there we go. So moving on from my time at Cabrillo and my work at, at Cal State Long Beach, I spent the fall, winter, and spring of 84, 85 applying to PhD programs. I applied to UC Irvine and to USC. I got accepted at both. Uh, I ended up going with the USC offer because that was going to be a chance for me to work with kelp. Had I stayed and gone to UCI, I would have continued on in fish ecology, which mm. not that there was anything wrong with that, but I had already developed my addiction to kelp at that point. So it was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, and then during that first summer highlighted down here, my first summer at USC, I worked with a professor at UCLA actually as a uh, scientific diver. So we went out, we, we worked off of a, a large boat out in the channel, working on uh, gelatinous zooplankton. So they're not all jellyfish, but they, they're all clear and, and like made out of jelly that drift along with the currents. So we would go out, dive off this boat, collect these things and do different things like that. So that was a a chance to get some firsthand research experience directly, which was beneficial. And, and actually this professor will come back up again later, later in my talk. So let's see here. 
Okay. Okay, so here, uh, sort of in the middle part of this uh, is when I was doing my PhD at USC. So I was there from the fall of 84 through the end of the fall of 93, late summer of 93, uh, where I studied the ecology of kelp forests. And, oh, this is the same slide. Sorry, I'm talking over the same thing. Here we go. So I, fed, I finished up my PhD. Uh, and this is the period in time when I started to uh, started thinking more about what am I going to do uh, after I finish this PhD. And as I was getting close to the end of that, I began to question whether or not academia was really where I wanted to be. Uh, and, and just sort of my thought process was, was that I could stay in academia and pursue my research, which I loved, or and write scientific papers that you know maybe a few dozen people in the world would read. Or the thought I had was maybe I can figure out a way to take what I know about science and share it somehow with a wider audience and increase what is now commonly more understood to be the public understanding of science. So that jumps back to Cesar Chavez momentarily. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned a postdoc and a lot of you may or may not know what that is. As it turns out, because of the number of PhDs that get produced in this country every year, there's a huge amount of uh, competition for faculty positions. And you have to be the cream of the crop to come out of your PhD program and get a faculty position. And so what happened was is that began to become more common. People would go off and do these things that are called postdocs or postdoctoral research positions. And it's essentially another, another apprenticeship, really. So you'd go out, you'd find a professor at some other, usually at some other institution. It doesn't have to be, but usually it is. And it could, you could make a change in direction at this point, too, in terms of what you're doing. Uh, and you do more research and you publish more papers. And it's really because the publications, the papers, are the real currency for getting a faculty position somewhere. So the more papers you have on your resume, the stronger it looks and the, the more likely you are to get offered a position. Uh, I did get offers uh, for postdocs at North Carolina State University, as well as at the US Department of Agriculture's Agriculture Research Service Station in Houston, Texas. I ultimately accepted the position at North Carolina State, which turned out to be definitely a good decision because it really helped to show me that ultimately the, ap the academic route was not gonna really gonna work out for me. I left North Carolina State a little more than five months after I got there and returned to California where essentially I made the permanent transition from academia to informal science education. Uh, the problem with postdocs is they don't, oh, I, I won't go into all that now. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna use up any more time than I absolutely have to. Um, when I got back, I reached out to people I knew here, including that professor at UCLA. And it turned out he was, he had an, a National Science Foundation funded program and they were gonna build a small, essentially the, the easiest way to call it was an aquarium down in Santa Monica at the pier, underneath the carousel actually on the pier. And because of my previous work with him, he said, yeah, you know, you might be, you might have the kind of skills we need to be somebody who could get this thing going. Because right now the building is full of trash or was full of trash and, and it needs somebody to guide it along. So I took the, uh, I took the position. Uh, I was responsible basically for uh, working with the university architects to sort of lay out, design the space, uh, determine sort of what the programming would be like, all of, all of sort of the nuts and bolts. We got the center open finally and, and I helped to operate it as the director through the first school year and then that following summer. And then the university decided to make some changes in the operation of this rather unique feature. Not many universities have their own little aquariums. There are a few, right. but uh, this, was, this one was quite unique at the time. Uh, so with those changes the university wanted to make, I decided ah, I need, it's time for me to depart. And that's when I went back to Cabrillo uh, for the second time. Uh, what was that experience like going back to Cabrillo? Because you've been there when you started off your career. Right. Now, 
you know, after teaching and just being in the field for so many years and going back? It was a little odd, I have to admit, because I, I didn't, I become comfortable with it now. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back as an aquarist, which I had, I was full time then, uh, mm -hmm. this go round, the previous time I was part time. So this time I went back as a full time aquarist, which meant I was there taking care of animals again and all that stuff. And it, it was pretty unusual for someone with a PhD to be doing that sort of thing. So I, you know, I didn't, it, it was it was different. It was different. Mm -hmm. Most of the staff, that's one of the interesting things about aquariums and museums, especially around here. Staff doesn't change much. Same people right. are there from year to year. So a lot of the staff were the same ones that I worked with when I was there the first time. <laughs> but it was good. It was a it was a good place right. to land and it gave me some more experience. One of the cool things about Cabrillo, if you've never been there, is because of its location right down on the beach in San Pedro, the staff will often come in from having been out on the beach and having, having collected some marine organisms that they'll be carrying in a bucket. And it's not at all unusual for them to set that bucket down in the middle of the exhibit hall and have kids come over and adults and they start talking about this stuff. Uh, so yeah, it, it was really uh, good. And I, I did that a number of times. The other thing, too, is we'd have to feed and do a lot of care for the tanks right out in front of the public because there was no behind the scenes really there. Mm -hmm. And so that led to a lot of discussion and commenting and uh, conversations with the, with the guests as well. So uh, it was interesting. It was very good for me. It really helped to solidify my, uh, my credentials, so to speak, in informal science education. Oh, uh, let's see. Da -da -da -da. So once I got to Cabrillo, the other thing I did was I kept in touch with many of the advisors who helped me as part of the Ocean Discovery Center project. Uh, and that, that paid dividends because uh, in, in early 99, uh, one of the advisors who was, who was from the California Science Center that I'd worked with and that I'd known for years, contacted me to let me know that they were looking for a curator for the new expansion project. And because of the topic, which was ecology, uh, she thought I'd be an excellent candidate for the job. So I applied, I got interviewed twice, and I got the job. And to use that old cliche, the rest, as they say, is history. Right. So... Just touch on something important. Please. Please. Our students and our recent alumni, that power of networking, how important it is. Yes. Really build out that network. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. It made all the difference in the world to me. Uh, the interesting thing was that advisor from the Science Center had been a graduate student at USC. So I knew her then. She also ran the lab, the USC lab out at Catalina. And while the Ocean Discovery Center thing was going on, there was this sort of rumor going around the local uh, science community about the fact that, well, somebody's building an aquarium at Exposition Park. And it was like, hmm. And I found out, well, the Science Center is redoing, or it wasn't the Science Center, the Museum of Science Industry is redoing itself and all this stuff. So I talked to her and I said, look, I, I don't know anything about the project, but from what I've heard, uh, I'm very interested in that project and would like to, uh, like to know more about it when, when the time's right. So she mm -hmm. reached out to me and said, this is it. This is the position I think would, you'd be ideal for. Um, the, the scary thing was that I went ahead and applied and that was probably in March or April of 99. And in, in June or July, I got another email from her saying, well, we're still looking for a, somebody to fill this position and I hope you will think about applying. And I responded to her. I said, I did apply. I sent my stealth in right after you told me about it. She said, oh my gosh. So she put me in touch with her administrative assistant who helped track down my material in HR. And it was like, yeah, okay, we got your material. Uh, we're going to set up an interview to have you come in and talk to uh, talk to the folks. So yeah, that, that network and I will admit my network is not as strong as it probably could or should be because I'm an introvert. So I don't it's hard for me to walk up to people and start mm -hmm. introducing myself. But if, if you are an introvert, try to get over it and make those connections as much as you can. Uh, so 
while I was, let's see, that's that. I can move on here. So back to a little bit of uh, academic work. Uh, as it says here, I began my career at the California Science Center as the curator of ecology, uh, although my title has changed over the years on December 1st, 1999, and I'm still there. Uh, there's one part of what is called the ecosystems gallery that we deferred building when we first built it. So I'm hoping to be able to stick around and get that part developed eventually in some reasonable time in the future. So I dove into the development of what would be the first planned expansion of the California Science Center since it opened in February of 98. And this was really my first detailed exposure to the field of informal science education. While it took longer than expected to get the project going, which is often the case with really large projects like this, we actually doubled the size of the gallery capacity at the, at the uh, Science Center with the opening of ecosystems. Um, between working with guests there, and then we had opened with, in concert with the LA Unified School District, we opened a kindergarten through fifth grade charter elementary school at the Science Center. And I worked extensively with the students there over the years. And what, it, what hit me in the course of all this was, okay, I have, I have this PhD. To be a curator at the California Science Center, you have to have a PhD in your area of expertise. That's not the case at all science centers or science museums. Uh, natural history museums, you need a PhD to be a curator. Uh, so I had the credentials that said, look, I'm a content expert. I know about the science of ecology. Uh, but what I didn't have was any real knowledge about the how people learn in these settings. And so at one point when the uh, project kind of bogged down a little bit from the, the fundraising didn't go quite as fast as uh, we wanted, uh, I started to really question whether this was ever going to happen or not. And I said, well, you know, if, if push comes to shove, I can take my PhD and I can teach high school biology if I need to. Right. So that set me off actually into the formal side of things. And I started looking around and I eventually heard about the fact that uh, they hadn't quite started the program yet, but there is within the School of uh, Natu Natural Science and Mathematics at Cal State Long Beach, there is the Department of Science Education. Yeah. And I uh, ended up talking to a professor there who had formerly worked at the Natural History Museum. And I told him what I was interested in trying to do and why, why I was looking to move on. I also took a, an, intro, an intro class uh, to science education. And, and honestly speaking, part of that class uh, required you to go and, and observe in a classrooms for a certain number of hours, mm -hmm. which, which I did. But two things happened is that. One is I developed a tremendous respect for classroom teachers. Uh, and secondly, I realized I don't think I have what it takes to be a day-to-day -day classroom teacher. I, I just don't have the, the patience and, and the whatever it was that these teachers were exhibiting. Uh, I did not feel like I had. So that's when I found out more about the, that that science, of, science education department had, was just about to institute a master's degree in informal science education. And I knew that would give me the background that I needed to know about how people learn in these environments, which could be a springboard for me to get into an education department at, at a museum or something like that. So anyway, uh, I got that. I, I now had that kind of background. And I, I really like to think that getting that degree, that Master's of Science Education and Informal Science Education, really had a positive impact on the exhibits that I developed uh, after completing it. So it was, it was very useful. So I'm almost done here. I know for anybody uh, who might be contemplating a career transition, the thought of that probably in your mind is something like this. It's like, uh, what, are you crazy? Changing careers? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna end up face down in that river in the bottom of the canyon. How how or why would I do that? And yeah, the, it it certainly could look like that. It 
Does it have to be quite as scary as all that, though? And again, I, I'm not claiming that I had all this planned out. But what I ended up doing was, let me back up here. I don't know if you can see my mouse very well. But I inadvertently yeah. built little bridges that took me over to this other side. And so I was able to go over there and hang out, figure out what was going on, and come back and keep working on my academic credentials and then go back over. So if you take a little time, and uh, part of it is you, you, you may not have any idea of what's over here. And I would admit, jumping from something you know here to something that's unknown over here is not something most any of us would want to do. So I managed a way to at least informally get over there and see, see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So that lack of knowledge of what was happening, uh, if you, so, so much of this for me was on the fly. The, the exhibit bogged down, so I looked at getting my science of education uh, degree and, and this happened, so I ended up at Cabrillo. Uh, fortunately, because of those sorts of two sides of my career, I was able to pull this off without too much stress or strain. And probably, and I'm not trying to toot my own home too much, I, I did that Master's of Science Education degree while the new building that would house the exhibit that I had curated was being was under construction at the Science Center. And I was deeply involved in that pro project. So yeah, the, I started in the summer, the fall of 2006, which is when we broke get ground. And I graduated in the uh, December of 2012. So it took me about three years, but it was very, very much worth it. Uh, I know we're up against a little bit of time, but yes. we have various questions that came out through sure. the chat that I Absolutely. want to uh, pass along. One of them from our audience member is, what is the reason you chose marine biology? Their problem right now is very, it's to make a hard decision about which area they need to study. There's ah. so many areas about marine and oceanography. Um, what they're interested in is in environmental protection. Do you have any suggestions for them? Uh, well, uh, let's see, how can I let me condense this down as much as possible? Uh, this is sort of another cliche in my background is I, got interested in marine biology because I got very interested in scuba diving when I was in high school, basically. Uh, I had grown up watching reruns, at least, of a couple of shows that were very influential on me. Uh, there are shows that maybe nobody who's on this call uh, would remember, but one was called Sea Hunt, and it was a it was uh, starred Lloyd Bridges as, I don't know what he was in the episodes. He was like some kind of an investigator or something, but he was a scuba diver and he'd go out and he'd like investigate crimes and stuff or something. And that just really, not that I wanted to be an investigator, but mm -hmm. he was underwater. And it was like, I just, I grew up in San Pedro around the ocean. My father had been in the Navy, although he'd been retired by the time I came along. Uh, so my family always had a connection to the ocean. Uh, the other show that really, and it probably pushed me into the biology side of things, uh, was I grew up at the time of and watched the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. And I was just blown away by all the different amazing marine creatures. And so that's really, I think, what pushed me into the biology side of things. Uh, honestly, my math skills uh, were not good enough to have been a competitive oceanographer. Uh, as an undergrad, I didn't do well in the simplified calculus class I had to take for that major of marine biology. Um, and while I went back to it during my first master's and was doing quite well, I can't remember what came up, but I had to drop the class almost at the end. So that's the main thing that kept me out of oceanography. Although I think I would have loved being an oceanographer because mm -hmm. it kind of jives with my interest in geology. I have uh, one thing I didn't mention here was uh, during my time at USC, I did go through and participate in a number of oceanographic cruises where I had, the longest one I spent was three weeks out at sea on a research vessel at a location about 500 miles due west of San Diego, where we were studying the currents around the seamount, so this underwater mountain with a flat top, uh, and how it changed the currents and possibly brought essentially fertilizer up into the lighted part of the ocean, 
where phytoplankton, the microscopic plants, could take it up and begin to bloom, and it would be the start of a food chain. Uh, so yeah, there's so much today, though. The whole the whole question of the conservation and everything is is a key one. I mean, for years and years in ecology, and that's one thing I tried to address in ecosystems. I still remember very clearly that you would get a book about science, ecology, or whatever. And you know, you'd flip through it. And what, what I always remember was that there'd be like two chapters at the end that, that even dealt with human beings. And it always struck me as odd because I don't know, there's there's a whole sort of discussion about this, and, and human beings has, have always sort of uh looked at ourselves as a little different than anything else, but it was like, but all of the things that are in this book apply to us every bit as much as they apply to a, a buffalo or a tree or whatever. And so these processes, these, ru these rules, if you will, apply to humans as much as to all these other animals. So why don't these books deal with the human side of things more? And that's really what I think a lot of environmental science has done, which I think is a good thing. And the other thing that's changed a lot too, that may or may, or may not help the questioner is that, um, environmental studies now focuses mostly on human things. And scientists for so long, we would study undisturbed environments, uh, pristine environments. And the fact of the matter now is we pretty much know that there really aren't any pristine environments, unfortunately, on Earth. Uh, but there are scientists who are studying how humans interact with ecosystems and all that. So I, I think there are those opportunities there. And uh, again, I think it all depends. I, I got very interested in the organisms, which took me into the marine bio. Uh, my weakness in math kept me out of oceanography, but I do think environmental studies is an important field and getting a better handle on how we fit into all of this. Because I think the only way we're going to solve some of these problems is if people begin, the average person, the people that I can reach by being at the California Science Center, understand, and that's really the message of the Ecosystems Gallery, is that the stuff you're going to learn about in here, about all these ecosystems, applies to us as much as it applies to any of the animals or plants you're going to see in here. And right. so if, if we can get that message out to people, then I think we'll, we'll be in pretty good shape. Wonderful. Um, the second question got us a curator of the California Science Center. How do you continue to be inspired? How do you challenge yourself and continue to elevate the various exhibits and projects you work with year after year? That's that's a great question, too. Yeah, we, we have it's a little hard at the Science Center. I was very fortunate when we opened ecosystems that we applied for and got a grant from the state of California under the under pro at the time under Proposition 84, which ultimately, and this is largely unheard of because at so many places, these big projects get funded by a very specific budget where the funding is raised for it. This Prop 84 grant provided me with a, mil a million dollars that I could use to go in and add new exhibits and upgrade some of the existing exhibits. Uh, so there's that. We have other plans of moving forward. Uh, the one exhibit that showed up earlier that you may or may not have noticed is the dogs exhibit, which mm -hmm. was the traveling exhibit. And I did that. That came along. That came along because the producers of an IMAX film, and we have an IMAX theater at the Science Center, right. that know our uh, knew our know our our CEO very well contacted him and say, hey, you know, we're, we're doing this new IMAX film about uh, dogs and all the amazing uh, things dogs can do and help us with and service dogs and rescue dogs and all these things. And it turns out our, uh, our CEO is an absolute dog nut. He'd, he'd been talking about doing an exhibit about dogs for years, and that was the catalyst. And we went out and uh, talked to, to local funding groups and said, this is what we want to do. We want to develop a, an exhibit to go along with this movie. And uh, the Annenberg Foundation, uh, mm -hmm. they had been doing a lot of stuff. And they said, sure, we'll, we'll fund it. And so that's how that came about. But yeah, in a lot of places, the funding comes through for a project. And then once the project is over, the, it sort of all shuts down. 
we've had the problem at the Science Center because the state of California clearly understands the need to operate facilities and things. But what they don't understand is how a museum needs to continue to upgrade their exhibits. And so it was easy to get funding to do new things mm -hmm. uh, from the state. Not easy, but easier. Uh, but it was very hard to get funding to go back and renovate anything. So we were, we were lucky just in the last two years, uh, our two initial exhibits, uh, The World of Life and Creative World, had both gotten to be 20 years old and the science in them had just become outdated. Right. We were very lucky and this, in my 25 years or more in, in the, this field, I've never heard of this happening. Uh, we had a couple, uh, the husband is, a, I think, a, a trustee on the Natural History Museum and they're, they're really well off. Well, they approached Natural History and said, hey, we wanna do, we wanna fund the development of an exhibit about reproduction and Natural history, we think, said, well, honestly, we don't really know. That's not the kind of exhibit we would do. That's not a topic we deal with. But we think if you go and talk to the folks at the Science Center, they might be interested. So we definitely were. We uh, ended up tearing out the world of life, the, the old life exhibit, and replacing part of it, which will eventually be completed and expanded, uh, with a big grant from from these two people, and it was it was really great. It was sort of another unheard of thing, but we just opened that in June, uh, and it it looks at how life reproduces itself and all the different ways that happens. Wonderful. Uh, another question: What are some options for scuba diving through aquariums? Do they offer offer certification programs? Uh, most of them. I would say do not. Uh, I think I think the Aquarium of the Pacific did, maybe still does, but I don't. I can't say for sure. I know at the Science Center we do have a volunteer diver corps, uh, but we don't we don't train incoming divers. You, you have to come in already certified. Mm -hmm. um, what we do offer, and which also the Aquarium of the Pacific offers, is if you are a, a certified diver, you can get trained to become what is known as a research diver, scientific diver, which is required. Uh, there's a whole long history behind that that I won't get into. So you can get that sort of advanced training, but yeah, not many offer the basic uh, beginning training. I am, well, <clears throat> I am a scuba instructor uh, and I have done private lessons and things. The, the biggest, the biggest thing that, that's a, an impediment to that, and it is for most instructors, is finding a swimming pool because you got to do, <clears throat> excuse me, you got to do training in a swimming pool that's required. And if you can't find a swimming pool that meets the requirements, it's very hard to do. So it, it's something I do, something I love. Uh, I also have become an instructor who can train people with uh, disabilities of different kinds to scuba dive. So I, I got that certification in 2017. And in 2018, I've certified my first student. She's a, a young woman who had been a paramedic. Uh, she, she's what's called a hemiplegic, which means half of her body, and for her, it's a vertical this, uh, se section, her, her left side, is essentially paralyzed as a result of, I think, a botched surgical procedure. So she could, she can do a lot of things. The training to train disabled people through the Handicap Scuba Association that I took didn't include any mention of hemiplegic. So when I first heard about that, and I heard about it from her girlfriend, who I had helped train prior, and she's a paraplegic, she was injured in a car accident. I honestly thought, how, what the heck is she gonna switch, just swim in circles? I mean, what's gonna happen here? Turns out, no, she actually passed the class with flying colors and uh, is, a, is a good diver. She can even rescue a, a able-bodied diver. So I do do those things. I don't do them very often because unfortunately as a, uh, the costs of things like the pool and my insurance, I have to recoup those somehow. And, uh, Unfortunately, if it's one student, 
then I have to charge an awful lot of money to be able to do it. So, but I am happy to try to talk to people and try to point them in directions to get the training they need if they'd like it. Wonderful. So I know we're up against time. Any yep. final words you want to conclude with um, today? And also, if any of our audience members want to connect with you, how could they connect with you? Yes. No, you, I'm not sure you're ever on LinkedIn or if you want to, um, they could contact us and we can share, connect you. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts you want to share with our audience? Today? Yes. Uh, there's, there's two, one related to each of the things you mentioned. I'll skip. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip this one too and go to this one. So you remember I talked about kelp early on. I was able to, through all this, maintain my interest and ability to deal with kelp. This is a photograph of the kelp forest exhibit at the California Science Center. All of the algae that you see in here, all of this stuff that looks like plants, and algae are not plants, they're different. I won't go into that. All the brown stuff, the giant kelp there, all this green stuff in the back, all this red stuff here, that's all live algae. And all of the stuff on the rocks recruited on its own and it's been growing in the tank since we opened in 2010. Um, we've had some reproduction by the giant kelp. Uh, and this tank has another section off to the left that you can't see. It holds about 200,000 gallons of water. And so we have all kinds of Southern California fish in here and it's all about the diversity of the marine organisms. Um, so I still have an interest in kelp. I still get to play with kelp sometimes. I don't do much research on it, but that's okay. I think the trade I've made, uh, as I said, we've been seeing close to or over 2 million visitors annually since we got Endeavor in 2012. Um, and that means that I've been able to touch many, many, many more people than I ever would have by publishing research papers had I stayed in academia. And that's, that's something I'm very proud of. And uh, I, I, think, I think the choices I made, as I'll often tell people, I, I do believe, I think I said this at the beginning, I do believe that I've done with my career pretty much what I wanted to do in the beginning. So I, I have no regrets. And the very last thing is, yes, I'm happy to entertain uh, questions from people. Uh, that's the easiest way to contact me, the most sure way. Uh, if you do want to go through uh, the alumni folks and, and they can contact me, that's fine too. Uh, I don't know how many people are on the call, but I assume that if all of you decided to email me, I'd probably feel completely overwhelmed. But I've always been happy to talk to students. Uh, having a PhD and being up near UCLA or USC rather. And I also teach scuba or have taught scuba at UCLA over the years, research diving there. So I'd often get undergraduates that I would come in contact with who'd want advice. And I'd, I'd sit down and talk to them about grad school or whatever they wanted to talk about. And I'm happy to do that here too. So yeah, you can use that email address or again, go through the, uh, the alumni folks. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do and teaching, you know, our next generation about conservation and just appreciation. Um, very thankful for your experience. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this chat. Um, again, if you wanna learn more about other chats, please visit our website. Um, and then the video will be up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So thank you everyone for joining.